so now we're going to move to our GitHub workshop. Um, let's see, which will be given by uh, Stefano Moya and Melvin Selim Adai. I'm ho I hope I am pronouncing your names a bit okay. <laughs> okay, good. Um, Stefano is a co-founder and project manager of PhysioPy and a strong advocate of open science. Um, he's currently studying the impact of cerebral physiology on bold imaging from resting, from resting state to task-induced activations. And uh, Melvin Selim is a PhD candidate working on explainable deep learning solutions for early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and they will uh, try to help you uh, make your first steps into the world of uh, version control. Uh, so um, I'll give the floor to you, Stefano, Melvin Selim. Happy workshopping. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, well, welcome everyone. And uh, I'm Stefano, uh, the other person that is going to speak today a lot. And possibly you're going to see more of his face than mine. Uh, he's Selim. Um, and yeah, so we're going to try to help you uh, do make your first steps in the world of version control systems, and in particular, Git and GitHub. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully, um, it's going to be all right. Right? Yeah. Can you yes. see it? Yes. Can you see it? Fine. Yes. yes. Thank you. Great. That's great. All right. So we are going to be together for a couple of hours today. Um, because, you know, like you just had lunch. So what's better to do after lunch than, not, I mean, uh, having a great course on Git, right? So. Um, at the end of these two hours, either you will be sleeping heavily, and I hope you will be very rested, uh, or hopefully you will have learned something about Git, especially how to configure Git, how to use it locally, and then how to play with other people on GitHub. Um, we're going to do a little introduction now uh, to explain and give you a little bit of terminology and explain a couple of steps. That we're gonna see uh, later. If you participated to any brain hack in November, um, you might find it quite familiar uh, because it's actually the same slide. And um, but for the rest, uh, we're gonna um, have an hands-on part, an hands-on tutorial, uh, and Selim is gonna play the part of a student that is uh, being introduced to Git. I'm gonna try to uh, keep up with. Uh, his uh, digiting commands and then getting process by explaining what's happening there. Uh, but he's actually much better than me already. So uh, we see how it goes. And uh, yeah, let's, let's start. All right. So first of all, uh, we have some materials that we prepared. Uh, actually, to be honest, um, this material is greatly inspired, if not almost copied. Uh, from the software camper tree uh, Git course. It's a great uh, course about Git. You can check it out. Uh, you can find the link in the material. And you know, like this is open source. This is open science, this is open software. Uh, when you find something that works and you just need to do a couple of tweaks to adjust it to your needs, you really don't have to reinvent the wheel. So that's what we decided to do. Just use something that was there and was working and Show it to you a little bit more. Uh, so you can follow this material uh, during the course, uh, during the hands-on part of, of the tutorial, uh, and it will stay there. Uh, so if you want to catch it up uh, later after the talk, or uh, you get lost at a certain point and you just want a bit of help, you can check it out. Uh, you can also ask questions on Discord. Uh, there should be people helping you if you if you feel lost. And for the rest, we will be around uh, with you for the rest of the day. So let's start the workshop proper. Is any of these situation in the screen familiar to you? Did you ever uh, had 25 different files with more or less the same name and more or less the same contact in the same folder? Did you ever wrote a code, decided that there was a little bit better way to do it and then commented a bunch of code, just wrote the little part that was better and then commented again. Uh, but kept the comments because actually it was nice code and you're not sure uh, that what you were doing was so bad or maybe it can be reused after in the future 
Or did you ever say that you couldn't work on something? It's a great excuse, by the way. Uh, but did you ever say that you cannot work on something because a colleague or a friend was working on it as well at the same time? Uh, so that was preventing you for doing, uh, from working on it as well. If the answer is yes, then you are lucky uh, because you just needed a version control system and you probably didn't know that yet. Um, so what are those version control systems? Version control systems are basically pieces of software that you install in your computer and they help you manage and track changes to some files that you decide them to, uh, to track. The most commonly used, at least um, in some uh, communities, version control system is Git. Um, Git is a software, like any other software you install it in your computer. We're going to see how to, to do it later. Um, and it basically just helps you saying, I did some modifications to a file, to a folder. Uh, please keep it in track uh, and, and check what, what happens, uh, check the differences and, and stuff like that. And if you don't, if you didn't know what Git is, you probably heard the word Git from GitHub. GitHub is a, a, is a website, uh, it's a web service uh, where you can find a lot of repositories and um, a lot of software, a lot of code, not only just code and software, actually also books, also other material uh, that you can freely use. Um, and GitHub is actually organized on Git. Somebody thinks that Git and Git are the same thing, but they're actually not. Um, and the difference between Git and GitHub is just that while Git is the content of something, of a website, GitHub is the website itself, is an aggregation or delivery system for you to have Git-based repositories all over the world. Um, you can understand better the difference between Git and GitHub if you think about the difference between any possible video and YouTube. YouTube is an aggregation delivery website. It has a lot of content. So that content is videos and you can access them. And videos are great already because they have a lot of, um, a lot of features, a lot of things that, that you can already do with videos. Uh, but YouTube gives you a complementary set of features for which those videos become interactive. So for instance, you have a community to refer to, you can chat, you can send messages, you can respond, you can have uh, emotional responses to the videos or um, share videos and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would like you to remember, although today we're gonna talk about Git and GitHub in particular, that Git and GitHub are not the only two version control systems out there. Uh, for instance, version control system software proper, there's not only Git, the other one that is quite used is called Mercurial, and it's a drop of uh, Mercury that you can see there on the screen. And GitHub is not the only aggregation or delivery website out there. Uh, you can also find Git-based repositories on GitLab or Bitbucket. There are other websites that work more or less like GitHub, uh, and you can check them out um, if you want uh, later. And finally, version control systems are not just softwares that you can install in your computer. Most of the time, you're probably already, already using them without knowing it. If you have a uh, Google Doc account, if you have a, a Drive account or any other cloud-based system, chances are that those cloud-based systems already implement a version control system without you knowing it, uh, without being um, so, um, so visible as Git would be. Uh, but they're already there. And if you ever use Wikipedia, actually you already definitely used a version control system because if you go on Wikipedia, check any, any article and check the history of the article, you can see all the mods, all the notifications, all the changes that were done to that article from the beginning of time. Uh, and that's the magnificent part, uh, magnificent feature of version control systems that can help you uh, track what's happening to your files. Now, I'm gonna spend a little of time explaining how a classic uh, Git and GitHub workflow uh, looks like. This is the most difficult part of this whole workshop. If you understand this part, you're gonna know everything by the end of it, um, and you're gonna become a Git master. If you don't, please maybe stop me asking me a couple of questions in, uh, in the chat uh, or over to Discord later, because this is important. So we start any Git workflow with just a folder, a file, 
um, we have to initialize this file folder to become a proper Git repository. Uh, what that means, like we're gonna see it later, but basically we're just saying to Git, hey, start tracking this folder, it's important. Um, and normally what happens is that you are gonna get a development track, um, a development line. And that development line is called a branch. And that branch is normally gonna be called either master or main, depending on uh, the version control system that you're using at the moment. And what happens is that Git help you tracking the changes that you make, not only in a temporal way, not only in a serial way, uh, meaning that you take a file, you do some changes, you save, you track this, the, the changes, but also in a parallel way, meaning that, for instance, if you want to try something new, something developmental, uh, something that you're not sure it's going to work, uh, but you're curious to see, and, and in any case, you think it's important to, to save, to have stored somewhere, you can open another branch, which is, again, another uh, developmental line, let's say, in which you start doing some changes, you save them changes, and then you commit them to Git. Um, Git is like your best friend, just very distracted. It's not going to pay attention to everything that you do. You have to ask it to pay attention. Uh, and that's because basically it doesn't want you to uh, actually, it doesn't want you to, to save all the changes that you make. It just wants to remember the important things. And maybe if you make some mistakes and you don't want it to see it, it's fine. Just don't tell it. Um, so you make changes, you track those changes by making a commit. And once you have those changes, once you have those changes, you can put them back and, and maybe you, you tested them, you, you, you're happy with, with your results, you can merge them back into the main development branch. Um, merging means that literally you are taking a piece of software as it was, you're taking a parallel change and just overwriting the first part of software with those changes. And that's what we normally do uh, in a normal uh, local Git flow. However, it might happen that you want to work on multiple things at the same time. For instance, you're developing a piece of code. Um, you are trying to change your preprocessing of MRI data using GANs instead of whatever you were using to, to do um, normalization of your uh, anatomical uh, maps. But at the same time, you discover that there's a bug in uh, your segmentation and you want to check this bug and, and solve it because you know it's important not to not to miss it so you can open a different branch change that the thing solve that fix that bug and then merge it again into main as we did with that but if you finish working on bug before you finish working on your developmental uh branch then you end up having a main that is divergent from the original main you started from, right? Because originally we didn't have any change, we introduced some change, but the developmental branch doesn't know it yet. So what happens is that maybe nothing happens, maybe actually you can uh, merge dev into main as if nothing uh, happened and there's no problem, there's no conflict, but sometimes some conflicts might arise, some some differences that you have to, to track into your, your developmental um, branch should be reported to the branch. So it's easy. You just merge your main branch into dev and then back into main. Now I'm going to add a complexity level to this story. Um, when you work in GitHub and when you work with other people, it normally happens that you have a repository that is initialized with Git and we will call that repository upstream. And this repository is exactly like uh, what I just told you. It's just that it's not exactly the repository you're working on. What we normally do when we're working in multiple people uh, on the same software is that we create our own versions of the repository. And that's because it helps us uh, working a bit better between each, with each other. Uh, we will call this new repository in which each one of us works origin. And what happens is that normally we fork, we literally just 
copy, we make an exact copy of our upstream into origin. And then we proceed as, as I just said. And the only difference is that, for instance, you can open new branches in your origin repository, do your changes, do your commits, and then once you're ready to actually merge and to actually give your changes and your commits to the main uh, community, to the upstream repository, you would just, instead of merging, ask it. So what you're going to do is a pull request. You're requesting somebody else to take your code and merge it into their version. And normally this pull request is, is more of a process than a, an event because it, it takes a little bit of time and we're going to have an example later. Uh, so I hope it, it's going to become clear why I'm saying this. Um, but it basically revolves around the conversation between you and uh, the original developers of Upstream. And once everybody is happy with the changes and with the way it's going to be integrated into main, then the merge is going to happen and everything is going to be as we saw before. What happens though is that maybe somebody else is working at the same time on upstream and they make changes again and you might find out that your upstream main repository and branch are different from what you had in your uh, in your repository uh, at the moment you, you started that. And what happens is just that you have to take that difference, that code, pull it to your origin uh, repository and then merge it in your branch and then again go on with the pull request. You might have seen that there's this terminology that is coming up like pull. We will see later there's another uh, term that is called push. It's just a way to indicate that you're either taking, co taking a code from somewhere, a pull, you're literally pulling code for somewhere else or giving this code to somebody else. So pushing this code uh, away from you and to another source. I'm going to add the last level of complexity to this story. And the last level of complexity is that everything that you saw up until now is actually not what is happening in your computer when you're using Git. Uh, everything that I talked about up until now is what happens on GitHub or other um, websites that are based on uh, Git. What happens normally is that you work on your computer, you work locally uh, on laptop or you change your, to your workstation or whatever. And what happens is that in order to do it, you have to take any repository that is existing remotely on internet and clone it to your local machine. You're going to end up having a local repository. It's the thing that you're going to work on with Git on. Um, and everything that I said up until now is exactly what happens in your computer uh, for the rest. So you still create branches of development, you do your changes, you track your changes, and then you commit them and you try to merge and you open PRs and everything else. The only thing that happens is that most of the time you're pulling software, you're pulling changes from upstream or from origin to your local machine and all the time you're actually pushing these local changes to your origin, to your remote repository, yeah, or at least the representation of your repository. And that's more or less it. That's more or less a, a GitHub workflow. Um, and one thing that I would like you to remember is that working with Git and GitHub can be challenging, but it lets you work in parallel on the development of new features. And not just in parallel, meaning that you can develop new features all together at the same time, but also in parallel with other people. And this by not disrupting the main version of your project. So you will always have, let's say, a code that is important, a version of your repository that is safe for you to share with other people, to use, uh, to adopt. And at the same time, you can still be able to develop and, and do things and try new, new stuff out. And there's a bonus feature Git also lets you force your team to double check what you're doing because every time that you're opening these pull requests, it's a time in which you um, are checking how things are changed and somebody else is going to say, oh, wait, there's a mistake here or, oh, wait, we can do this better and stuff like that. And that's a great plus. All right, before we continue with uh, the rest of 
the material on the slides, we would like to start some work, um, work on, hands-on work. Okay. All right. So as I said today, we're gonna play a little role play game. Um, and the role play game is that we have a student here and the student is called Selim. And we're gonna try to show you how a configuration and then the use of Git locally works. Again, if you want to follow us and, and do things with us, you can, you can go back to the material. Uh, maybe I can, oh yeah, it's great. Uh, you have the link in the chat of Zoom. Thank you, Dorian. And uh, if Selim, you want to start sharing your screen, you yes, can start. I'm... I'll oh, be right. starting as soon as I reassign my permissions. So the first steps that we're going to see with Selim are how to configure Git, which is normally the first barrier that we face and something that normally is like, like we already know that Git is not so easy to use, especially for beginners. Um, and obviously having this, this big wall in front of you that is the configuration that might not work and you might not understand why, it's, it's basically what makes most of the people drop the use of Git already. And just as a disclaimer, today we're gonna use uh, the terminal. And the reason for which we're gonna use the terminal and Git from the terminal is that it's not only more convenient for you in order to understand the process of Git, uh, but it also lets you be more uh, adaptive to any environment you might be working on. Because for instance, if you're working remotely on, on your uh, HPC, on your clusters, or you're working in the office, you might not have a graphical interface with that, uh, with whatever you're working on at the office. And that, that happens, for instance, in this moment, it's, it's quite typical. Like for instance, uh, I'm almost never at my office. I'm always working from home. I do things at home with my amazing workstation, with my amazing screen and my amazing graphics. But then in order to connect uh, to my office, I have to use the terminal only. Obviously, it becomes impossible to use a GUI there. Um, the other reason for which we are showing you things on a terminal is basically because it's cool. It's like, it's that nerdy part of using Git that you can show off to your friends saying, hey, look how cool I am now that I'm using Git. Because if you just show a GUI, then you're like, all right, cool, whatever, sure. But all right, I see that Selim shared the screen. Yes, sorry for the hiccup. It's all right. Um, oh, I'm back with my cool terminal. <laughs> all right, okay. So what would be the first step that we're gonna to introduce today? I guess that the first we step, as I was saying, is- find yeah, yeah. if we have some Git. Do we have it's it? Installed. That is true. Um, it's quite typical for computers, especially if they're Unix-based, to have GitHub pre-installed uh, when you open them. Uh, but a way that you can check if that is true is basically just doing uh, what Selim just did, which is just check if you have a Git version. If Git version returns you a version, that means that yes, it's installed. Otherwise, you have to install it and you can find the installation in uh, the material. The second thing that we have to do is a configuration. Uh, we need to tell Git some information about ourselves, especially your name and your email. Um, and it's convenient to use the same email that you will use on GitHub, but let's start with your name. So let's start. It, well, how to, what's the comments? It's the git config. Yes. Sort of configuration. We just want to. And then we're going to say, if we want this configuration to be working for all of our computer uh, or just for one particular repository, in this case, we're going to say, keep this information anytime that you use Git on any repository ever. Uh, and we're just going to say, so please initialize the configuration file in which we declare that our username, quite literally, is, in this case, Salim Matei. And once, yeah, if you don't have any issues with that, 
then we move on with the next configuration that is our email. And we're still going to say it's a global configuration, so it will work every time that we use Git in a repository. And we're just going to give a simple email. And again, it's quite nice if this email is the same that you will use uh, remotely as well, because it will help you being a bit more frictionless when you do things. Once we created our configuration, we might need to create a folder in which we will put our code. And I know I'm saying a lot the term code, but actually Git is not just for code itself. Um, Git can be used for anything you can think about. It can be used for games. It can be used for recipes. It can be used for your papers, your thesis. Um, I, I have a GitHub account. I use it for, at this point, everything. I really don't know I was living before that and how I was organizing my work without it. Um, and I saw the differences on working on a paper with other people using GitHub, even if that paper was a LibreOffice file, compared to when I was not using it. Trust me, it's so much better. It's so much uh, less complicated than it seems. And also the process becomes more fluid. It would um, be also useful to remember that, uh, yeah, we can use everything for Git, but not for the large files. Yeah, that is true. Um, normally Git and GitHub especially have some limits on the file size that you have. Um, so if you try to share, for instance, uh, nifty files on GitHub, that might become a problem. Not only because actually sharing nifty files on GitHub doesn't make so much sense because you're not going to change them that much, uh, but also because they're quite big and there's a limit on both the repository size and the, the file size that you can share in order not to make your process clunky. Um, you are going to see some um, yeah, we are starting to make a report and do things, but before that, I just wanted to show that uh, what we can just see what we configured. Yes, uh, and I was about to say, you might see some, um, some commands that are not working on your computer. Probably you might not have those installed. For instance, um, Salim is using now here uh, a Mac. And these same things, the same commands will work on a bash terminal in uh, Linux. If you have Windows, you might want to use the uh, WSL or use a, a particular thing that is called uh, git bash that basically creates an environment and a terminal for you to use git in the same way you would be using it in uh, Unix. Um, Cutting this moment is not that fundamental as a command, but it's just for us to know that we did our configuration right. You can just go to the folder where you created, uh, when, where you use the git config and check if you have a .git config file and open it and check that uh, whatever was there is exactly what you wanted. All right, if you are ready, I think it's time to create our repository, right? Okay. So we can create a um, we can create a folder in which we will insert all of our uh, documents and files. And today I think we're gonna work first on a sort of paper. It's not a real paper, but bear with it. It's just to try some stuff out. Now, if we make the, the, the folder and we move into the folder, we can see that the folder is empty. And the first thing would be to actually add something. So we start with some, uh, right. We start with some uh, documents, but first, a good thing that we can do is initializing this repository. A folder is just a folder up until you don't tell Git to follow it, to track it. So in order to do that, uh, we're going to say Git init. That's the magic word for Git to start understanding what is happening and start tracking uh, your changes. And Selim now is working on an article. And I'll be also sharing that. All right. Maybe it would be better if I share the desktop. Yeah, 
Yep, let's write our awesome Git article in a second. Yeah. So this is our article. Mm -hmm. So already prepare some some material for for this uh, workshop because otherwise it will be too much time intense. Um, bear with us. You can still find uh, parts of these of these uh, finds in the material. And if you find it intimidating, if you can just create some article thing and write whatever you want to write and keep like that. Yeah, it's for the scope of 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 this part of the workshop, uh, just little changes are going to be enough. Yes, now we save, right. save yeah. the document. So let's see what happens. So if you want to see what is happening in your repository, you normally ask, what is the status of your repository? And that's what Selim is doing here. So we're going to say git status. We can see that uh, in the branch in which we are developing in this moment, that for the moment will be master to keep things simple. Uh, there is no commit. It's like there's no file, nothing happened, which is not true. We know that we did some modifications, uh, but Git just didn't track them. What happens is that Git is telling us, you're not tracking it. Do you really want to just ignore this file changing or it's just that you forgot to track it? Um, and that's that. what we're going to do now. Uh, we're going to tell Git, please track this, uh, this file. So we're going to say to Git, add this file to what you should be paying attention to. And this file will be added. You can say add a particular file, like add article.md. You can say add the whole folder. That's what that dot stands for. Uh, you can say add everything ever, and you would use a, a, a little star, little asterisk, I guess it's called. Uh, and then again, if you ask what's the status, you would see that there are some changes. Now Git is recording those changes, is tracking those changes, but we didn't commit them yet, which means it's not going to be saved forever. It's just there for us to know what's happening. The next step is committing them. So it's telling it, yes, please do remember these things. Like this is a status. This is a moment in which I have a modification and I want you to remember it as it is. And in order to do that, we're going to say git commit. But then it's also important for git and actually other people using it, even yourself later in time, what changed. Uh, git is quite smart. It can tell you the differences inside the file. It can tell you which files changed, uh, but it cannot tell you exactly what you did in a qualitative way. That's up to you. And that's what uh, we're doing here. So we're going to add a little message by using minus M and then a message. For instance, we've wrote an article in a really good format and that's a great news. Mm. And once we're ready, we can give it to Git. Now Git is recording our changes. And if you give again a git status, we can see that uh, we have nothing else to commit because everything is tracked in this moment. Let's try to do a couple of other uh, modifications and add a couple of things to this file. Let's add additional things that I won't be showing you. <laughs> For instance, we can add a couple of lines just saying, how beautiful is today? Uh, in San Sebastian is actually yeah. 17 degrees, great sun, more or less, some, some uh, clouds out. Great. Uh, mm. But yeah, it's probably a good 10 degrees more than where most of you are in this moment. And yes, I'm saying that to make you jealous. But anyway, mm -hmm. you can say, <laughs> you can put anything that you want inside your article and then save it again. And then once you made those changes, you once again want to track them. You want to tell Git to do it. So that's what we're going to do. Yes, again. I did some modifications and added better information from you and my side because it's snowy here. <laughs> <laughs> and people should know that. All right. So we see again, there's some differences and we can add them again. And the way we're going to add them is exactly as we did up until now. So we're going to say again, 
add the files and then we're going to commit those changes with a message in this case we're updating the article with the weather with the local weather and now we can do a neat trick that is this let's say that we leave this article here for a while and then we want to come back in a month and in a month obviously we're not probably remember what we did and what those different tracks, different changes that we saved and ask it to remember where. So how can we check what happened in the file? Um, the first thing that we're going to do is check the history of Git, the history of this repository. And in order to do that, we're just going to do a Git and then log. We're going to ask to Git to log the changes that we saw up until now. And what you're going to see is basically as weird number that's called a commit ID, it's going to come in hand later because that's what we're going to use to compare different commits in time. We're going to see that one of those commits is currently uh, the head, the last commit that we did on a branch. In this case, the branch is called master. We're going to see who was the author and possibly if it's, if it's public, uh, what is their email for us to say, you did a great job, or no, you really didn't do a great job. Uh, we will see the date in which it, would, it happened, and then we're gonna see the message that we put before that will give us an idea of what happened there. And if we want to see actually what were the differences inside the files, we can do another thing that is called a git diff. See the differences. So if we try to do git and then diff, we can say, Okay, let's compare two different commits. We're going to take an older commit ID, that is that huge number that you find there, mm -hmm. and then we're going to use a earlier, uh, sorry, a later uh, commit, which is another huge number and ID. And you're going to see that the file that we can, that, that we modified is there. Uh, we have everything. Well, actually, we don't have the full file. We just have a part around the changes that we made. And then we're going to see what we added. Uh, so for instance, in the last commit, we added that the weather is nice in San Sebastian and it's snowing in Ankara. And I'm sorry for people in Ankara. Actually, I miss snow, so I'm not that sorry. I'm a bit dense, but it's all right. Okay, so before we move to the next little step of our workshop, I want you to... Um, have another idea about what you can do with your Git repository. And this, this little idea is that I've been working on uh, this project that is called Pizupai. It's uh, basically a library of uh, tools used for physiological uh, analysis in MRI. Um, and this is a niche of a niche of a niche. It's, it's basically like somebody working on a little uh, theme, a little topic, in a very different way from other people working on that same topic. And that's normally something that either people really know how to look for or will never be found. And at the same time, I have the idea that that could be useful to somebody. So what I normally do is that I want to share this thing with other people. And that's what uh, Physipi is there for, sharing what we're doing with other people, hoping that other people will find it useful for their research as well. And in order to do that, we decided to put everything that we do on GitHub and make it public for other people to use. But this engagement with the community comes with a price, obviously, because you're not playing anymore in your computer alone. And the first price that you have to pay is basically, oops, sorry, not that, is basically this. You have to make your work available to others, not just by putting it online, but also telling them how to use it. And what this means is basically just to license your work, add a license to your repository that you're going to put online, if you're ever going to put it online. Um, paradoxically, any work that is not licensed, even if it's out there in the open, is not public. And that's because you really don't know how you can use that software. Uh, what are the infringements that you would do to the copyrights, to the people, uh, for the people that worked on it first. 
Um, and that's a problem because like technically, if you see something on, for instance, GitHub or online in general that doesn't have a copyright, you shouldn't be using it. What normally happens is that if you find something that doesn't have a license and doesn't have a copyright, you use it anyway and you just don't say where you took it from. And that's also not that good, not that transparent and not that open sourcey. And that's not fine. So luckily there is a super useful website out there. It's called Choose a License. And Omen Nomen, it's actually just a website to choose the license that you want to adopt for your work. Uh, there are many open source licenses out there. Uh, you can pick one up. It's, they, just, they don't need to be code related only. They, like, there's licenses for uh, not software, like just documentation or things like that. Um, and it's just about going on this website check what license you would like to use and then use that. And at the same time, the other nice thing that you can do with, uh, with Git and GitHub, if you publish your things online, is that you can start to track them in a way that is more familiar to scientists, which is basically just giving those repositories a DOI, a number that you can use to track your citations as much as you would do with a paper. Uh, as Daniel was saying today, uh, there are different points, there are different parts to the work of a researcher, and we're used to this thing that only papers should be shared, but it's not true. And if you want to start people to know that you did something and they should be tracking and they should be citing you if they use that something, the best way to do it is add this number, which is DOI, and you can do it with Zenodo, that is this uh, web service that helps you tracking changes and, and your repositories on GitHub. So the next step in our uh, workshop is adding that license. Yes, so we will be adding license to our amazing article. So selling went online before, check that Yeah, that I just website. copied the CCBY license from the original repo of yours or... Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> In this case, the license that we're using is, as Salim said, a CC BY, which is basically just a license that says, this work made, was made by this person. If you want to use it, share it, change it, modify it, do whatever we want with it, just say that that came from another person and that's fine. Uh, so what's happening here is that we are adding this reference, this, sorry, this, uh, this license to, uh, the repository that happened off screen. Uh, so Selim now is, is checking the status of, of Git and we see that there's a new license, a new file that contains this license. Uh, we added some references in the meantime because, you know, like it's a paper, so that can get, we should cite somebody else. Um, and we also added a readme. A readme is another very useful file. Um, it's basically the first thing that people will see when they open your repository on GitHub. And it might just say, hey, uh, this is a code and you can use it for this reason, or um, please do this, this and that if you, if you read it, or just like, hi, that's me, and this is my code, uh, and this is my dog, and a nice picture of dog. Uh, but more or less, that's what you could use that readme for. Once we added these files, instead of adding them automatically, I'm gonna show you a little trick. And this little trick is the fact that you can skip adding manually every file if you just ask it to commit and then automatically add, which is like minus A, and then we still want to give a message. So M and then the message, which should be just add the license. Actually, this comment is much more useful for forgetful people like me. Yeah. Because I always forget the dot after get add. That's the big issue for me. All right, sorry. That's right. Uh, and luckily, this little trick doesn't work when you created a file and yes. it didn't modify it yet. So what we're going to do again is actually just starting them and then we're gonna commit them with a message. Nope. 
So to show the trick, I think it would be better if I edit some file. Yeah. Let's do it really quickly. Let's write something to read me. Now testing the amazing comments. And you see that basically this command just made us changes and track all the changes at the same time, which is quite useful if you're, you know, in a rush and you want to put stuff there and then push them out. Um, all right, so we had a license, we added a readme. Um, I think we are ready to get to the next stage, which is basically share this repository with other people on GitHub. And in order to do that, we actually have to go on GitHub if we don't have an account on GitHub, it's, this is the best time to open one, to make one and, and to sign up for the service. They're not paying us to say that. It's just that everybody's there. But as always say, if somebody wants to pay us in order to say it, we're not against it. Um, what we're gonna do is actually to create a new repository in GitHub. Uh, and in order for you to see exactly what we're doing, uh, Selim, can you just, Go click on that plus uh, icon that is next to your small face in the top right corner. Not sure which is that. Okay, just go up in the page yeah. and if you check on, sorry, just go up a little bit. That's great, thank you. If you check uh, on the top right corner of the page, there is a bell, there is a plus, and then there's your face. Click on that plus, please. A ripple. And yeah, we are doing a new repository. That's a literal creation of something that will track your local changes online. Once we do that, we can change the name, like we can give a name. Uh, for instance, in this case, article, we can because we want to keep things easy. We can give a little description. We want to make them public. We don't have to make them public though. That's, that's the great thing about GitHub. If you want to uh, just use it as a, as a sort of uh, cloud-based system and then just track your changes there, you can make it private and nobody will be able to see it unless you give them the permission to. Uh, but in this case, we are all for open software and open uh, science and transparency. So yes, it's going to be public. Uh, once we're ready, we already have a readme file. We already choose the license. So we're just going to create the repository. And once we do that, Git is going to tell us, okay, that's great. You just have a little bit of setup to do before we move on. And I accept all of your files here. Uh, in this case, we can do two or three different things you could be creating a new repository from scratch uh, because you wanted first to create the uh, remote version of this repository. You might be uh, importing code from a different repository. Like for instance, you were using Mercurial to track your repository and you just wanted to, uh, to switch to GitHub. Or maybe as we did, you already have a repository and you're trying to push it uh, from the command line. And that's what we're gonna do next. So our Git local knows that there's a repository there. It knows that there are some files inside. It knows that it has to track the changes and it's tracking some changes. The next thing to do is, um, can you see Can you see the, the terminal? If you can't, just let me know. I can make it bigger. Can you see? Yeah, you can see. That's that's great. All right. Um, so the thing that we have to do 
is to tell Git, okay, now this local repository has a remote version, can be uh, pushed somewhere, has a remote representation. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna just say Git, there's a remote repository. We're gonna, it's the first time that we're saying there's a remote repository. So we actually have to add this repository. And the only thing that we're gonna do is just say, in this case, this is our origin, our main uh, repository that we will work on remotely. And it's just add origin and then the um, the link to the to the repository online. So in this case, it's https github.com, iml dev, and then the article. And once we did it, it should be saved. But in order to check it, the only thing that we have to do is to git remote and then ask that to list our, uh, our uh, remote repository. And that's just done with that minus V. And that's great. And you're going to see here that there's a couple of terms that we didn't, well, we talked about push before, which is basically when you want to send code somewhere else from you. Uh, we didn't talk about fetch. Fetch, as, as the word should indicate in English, it's not that different from pool. The difference between a fetch and a pool, it's very, very small. And it's the fact that when you fetch, you only ask Git to uh, give you the history of the changes that you did. Uh, it's basically, it, it's asking it to say, what happened there? Um, when you do a pool, you're actually saying, you're not just asking what happened there. You're saying, hey, please tell me what happened there, but also make it happen there as well. Uh, make me up to date with, with, the, with the changes. And that's what we see here. The other little thing that um, I suggest people to do is this. As we saw before, uh, and it's gonna become clear later on, we might not work with only one repository at a time. Uh, we normally work with an origin, that's our repository, that's our personal repository. But if you're working on a community, if you're working with other people, we might have an upstream, a different version of the repository that is the one that we use for main interaction with the community. And if that's the case, you might find yourself pushing and pulling from different repositories. And sometimes that becomes confusing. Uh, and sometimes you might do some mistakes that makes you send your code, not to your own repository, but to the common repositories where it shouldn't be yet. In order to avoid this step, we're gonna do a little configuration step more. Uh, and the little configuration step is this. We're gonna just say to this repository in particular that we want to, anytime that we push something, it has to go to a particular remote repository. And we do that by saying git. And then again, it's a configuration, so it's config. And then uh, inside this configuration, it's just basically saying that every remote, so remote, that I have to push to as a default. So instead of a space, a dot push and then capital D default is equal to uh, with a space inside, sorry. Um, origin and we want it to be always origin. That's great. And, and here they are. Um, and the reason for which we're saying this is that by doing this, we are basically saying that every time that we're working with this repository um, and we're pushing something, something without remembering to add actually origin as a target, we are gonna uh, always end up having things there. If you go inside your repository, you might see a folder that is called .git. That's where basically all of the Git configuration is stored. And if you open up the configuration file, you will see the last thing that you added, which is this remote push default origin. And that's uh, a way to be sure that 
anything that you would do, you will actually do it to your own repositories and not somebody else's. And trust me, this is incredibly useful. Uh, I did this mistake a bunch of time in which I magically pushed some changes that I did to actually other people repositories. And they were like, why did you do this to me all the time? And I was like, sorry. Uh, and in this way, I just managed to avoid me being clumsy with Git. All right, so once we have all of these things, we're ready to push for the first time something out there in the remote repository. And in order to do that, we're literally gonna push. So Git, push. Now, uh, another thing that we didn't do yet is to say, I'm really sorry, I will be distracted and I hope you actually can hear me when I speak, uh, is to say which remote repository we're gonna sorry not just which remote repository we're gonna track but also which branch we're gonna track so as i told you before a repository has different branches we can have uh, a different branch active at the same time locally but each branch can be tracked with a different branch remotely right so if you just push in this moment we're working on master locally um but at the same time yeah it's fine we're gonna have a master branch online so what we're gonna say is just uh minus u minus u stands for actually set set upstream branch something like that um yeah. right and then we're gonna say origin because that's our uh target repository and then the branch which is master in this case. And if you do that, it should be tracked now. Um, and yeah, and we can see that now we have this new branch online uh, that is called master and it's targeting our branch master here and that our branch master is set up to track the remote branch. So great, we did everything. If we go back to GitHub, we can see that now there's some files there. It's a repository, we're happy about it, and it's up there, and it's, you can find it actually. If you if you go on GitHub and look for imldev, and then article. I'm just sharing the link on the yeah, chat if I could. You can access it and, and check it yeah. and see what the difference were. Or contribute, send pull requests, or once we show it. It's our fun repo. Exactly. And begging for being written. Written. So. <laughs> so if you want to write an article for Selim, uh, please do it. It's here. You can put it there. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So a very quick explanation. And then uh, I'm going to see if there's any questions or something is not clear as we would like to. Um, so very little explanation. You might have seen that I was talking about a branch calling called main and now we're working with a branch called master and if you go on github you might find some um some repositories that are called must like that have a a main development branch that is called master some repository have a main development branch that is called main what happened is that recently uh there were some pressures uh from different communities to avoid the use of the term master. Uh, in this case, master is not used offensively. It's just a way to say, this is a ma like, it's like a master book. It's like the main copy, the original copy, the, the copy that you should never change of a repository. Uh, now master can have other connotations in English, in the English language. So people started to, to prefer to use the term main. You can use whatever you like. Just know that every time that you want to find uh, a repository online and you're looking for the main development branch, the thing that where you should take things from, uh, that might be called master in some cases, main in the others, and that's all. Uh, nothing big, nothing huge. All right, so now that we saw how to put our repository online, I think that it's all with this repository. Yes. Is there any question? Is there something that is not super clear? Um, yeah, I have a question myself, actually. Um, I quickly missed what the uh, minus U flag means when pushing, because I've never used that before. Right. <laughs> so the real command is actually a bit more complicated. 
it's basically set remote branch. Uh, minus u is just a quick, uh, a quick flag to do that. But if you want to know what the real flag is, uh, it's just upstream everyone. actually. Yeah, it's set oh, upstream. Okay. I'm gonna copy to the chat uh, in which git push set upstream and then origin and launch. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So in so you're setting the origin as upstream. Here. Yeah. So the thing is that. The, the thing that is confusing for me is that, yeah, so you can use this command to set also the origin as upstream. But technically, we did it already because when you add a remote, you're already saying this will be my remote repository. And also, the term upstream is quite confusing because you can have multiple remote repositories. Normally, upstream would be the furthest repository from you. So, for instance, the one that your community will use rather than you yourself. Uh, and normally we call origin the one that you yourself are going to use remotely. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, what we're doing with that command is not setting the real repository, we're setting the branch that we want to use on that repository. Uh, and again, that's why like, we just show the minus u command. It's not just because it's fast, but also because like might, like it's, I know it's a bit more difficult, but it might otherwise create some confusion with the rest of the terminology of Git. Uh, but yeah, that's that's basically what it is. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Stefano, just a uh, follow-up question on that. So that yes. um, U-flag also, does, so the upstream flag also allows you to directly push to, for example, if you're allowed to, for example, if you're a manager of a uh, of a community rep repository, um, that's of course not really wanted because normally you would want to work with pull requests, of course, but say that you, you can, that then uh, in theory, theoretically you can uh, add the U flag to directly push to your origin directory. Or is yeah. that? Yeah, so here's, okay, yes. Uh, yes or no, there, this is something that I wanted to skip because it's a bit more complicated. Oh, but, sorry. All right. <laughs> it's all right, it's all right, it's all right, uh, it's cool. Um, okay, so yeah, so as I'm gonna butcher your name badly, I think it's, it's pronounced Stein? Um, yeah, yeah, great job. Fine. Okay, cool. <laughs> Learning a bit of, of Dutch every day. Um, of course, it's probably not Dutch, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so what happens here is this. Yes, when you're working with multiple people, uh, you can create particular conditions of authority and basically things that people can do with your repository, right? Um, Normally, what happens is that you want almost nobody to be able to push directly things to your upstream, to the community repository. Uh, normally, the only person that can do it is um, the administrator, the, the main, the, the project manager, or, or whatever you call it in your case. And that's because you want that version to be always the most clean of all, always the most stable of all. Because basically, if other people are going to adopt it, or even you are going to adopt it somewhere, you want it to work every time. Um, and it's not a matter of trust. It's just that when more than one person starts to work on the same project, then things become a bit confusing, right? And uh, sometimes it's, it's just that, like, a good mistake, but mistake happens. So that's what you want to avoid. Um, if you set... So you can set your upstream to be something else. You can normally set your upstream to be your origin. The thing that happens is that every time that you set your upstream as origin, you're just gonna be synchronized locally with your origin. And that might not be the best idea ever because some development will still happen in your upstream, right? So you have the community repository, that's what is gonna change faster than every other repository possibly because that's where more than one person is working on um, at the same time you have your origin that's a bit more slow because obviously it's just you working on your things and normally yes you want your 
your current repository to be synchronized with your origin, with your own remote repository, right? But if some changes happen in upstream, then you have to keep track of them. And your origin will not automatically be keeping track of those. So the best thing that you can do is actually this. As I showed you before, as Asalim showed you before, actually, uh, you can set a remote repository where you always push your things and at the same time set another remote repository uh, where you only fetch or pull things. So if you want, the best thing to do would be to set, uh, sorry, git uh, push. Git <laughs> useless. Yeah, git push uh, add set upstream upstream and then whatever branch you want to track with upstream it's normally main or master because that's that's where everything changes and you have to integrate the the, the, the differences from and then with the other with the other configuration the git configuration um, remote push default use origin so that you would be always pushing only to origin now if you're administrator or uh project manager or whoever takes care of your upstream repository is uh, smart, I would say, a little bit, just, just a little bit, not, not too much, uh, but a little bit smart, it's going to prevent you from direct pushes to upstream. So the only thing that is going to happen is that if you set your upstream um, as the as the default push uh, repository, it's just not going to let you do it. And you're going to see a lot of errors appearing in the, in the terminal and, and just a lot of things saying, hey, you cannot do it. Sorry. And then you're going to be like, what's happening? And then yada, yada, yada. But actually, the, the, the discussion that arose from it was very interesting to me, that indeed you can, you can, switch, you can actually discouple it. You just, yeah. because that's basically where I ran into, that, uh, that, that you're constantly then pulling from your own origin. Which you, that you Furthest upstream to pull the changes. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Stefano. Is there any other question? Except for when this will work and. I don't see anything in the jet either. So I think you'll. Okay, cool. You're good. I hope that it means that it's clear. Otherwise, it means that people are already sleeping or they're lost. Um, if you're lost, again, just check the materials and ask us a question on, on Discord. Uh, if you're sleeping, I hope you're having a good nap and it's resting and it's definitely going to prepare you for the next panel. But for the moment, let's move on. And we're going to move on by doing actually a fork, working with three different repositories at the same time. That's where you start doing some juggling and not just some kidding. Um, so, Salim. What's happening now? And I'm gonna say, sorry, I was trying to cover some, some noise. Uh, what's happening now is that um, we prepared a little um, repository in GitHub. Uh, this repository is not an article anymore. This is actual code. This is actually a Python, uh, a Python module that I just put together uh, a bit of time ago. It's very simple. It's nothing fancy. It's just stuff that I find myself doing over and over and over. But then I thought, yeah, okay, I did it. Let's put it online. I don't expect people to find it. I just say if somebody is interested in using it and it can help, just do it. Um, and then in, rather than using that particular repository that is called new deals, uh, we, just, we just created a version of the same repository for this workshop. And um, the original one, this is the copy one, and don't forget to start. Yay. Um, this other repository that we created for today is called Legendary Oct Invention. That's not a name that I came up with. That was the default name that Git uh, gave me and suggested me, and I liked it, so why not? Um, and what happens here is that, yeah, so you can, when you go online, maybe you're working on your preprocessing. You might know about something called fMRI prep. fMRI prep is what you can find fMRI prep in Git. Um, and when you go on Git, you can actually start watching the changes that happen to a repository. And that's where uh, you see the watch uh, icon on the right. If you start something, it means that you're not just following, but you're actually 
liking it a little bit. It's like putting a like in Facebook or whatever you use in this moment. Um, and that just helps people to know that somebody is following you uh, and checking what you're doing. And then the most important thing of all, you can fork this repository, which means this repository here will become your upstream, and then you're gonna create an origin. Um, so yeah, so for today, we're gonna create the origin for uh, Selim, that's I am in dev. You can see that it's automatic. Um, when it's, and, the, oh, sorry, when the repo is a little bit big, it creates a, a nice animation. So it, that's another thing. While forking, you are watching the fork animation, but it's, it didn't happen here. <laughs> Unluckily, it's, it's too little, like you, you have to go for, for bigger stuff. Um, but yeah, and at the same time, like it helps people to know that there's a fork uh, of this kind. Um, all right, so once we are ready, uh, we have this repository online. We can see that it's forked. So we have an upstream, it's clear that we have an origin and now we can bring this repository to your local machine. That is the opposite of what we just did. Uh, in this case, we're gonna use a command that is called git clone and Selim, can I ask you to take care of it for a second while I try to make people stop doing noises very quickly? Okay, I'm just Thank you very much. cloning the repo from my fork. And it takes a little bit of time and you can see the name of the repo and let's visit what's happening. And we can use a ls command to see what's in here. And there are several, uh, actually, readme license and the necessary setup files. What we will do is to try to contribute on Nutils, right? We want to do some useful changes on Nutils. So there's several Python files. So we'll be typing in Python. And here in any coding practice or any typing thing, I find it necessary to find some uh, nice text editor for you. I, I, I'm a big fan of Atom, so I'll be using Atom. And it's from GitHub and it's hackable, it's tiny. So I'll be just opening this file from using Atom from terminal. I don't know how you see it, but we are seeing uh, the file. <laughs> okay. So I can just make it share the Atom, then go to terminal back, so it would be easier for you to track. So there's several fancy packages that Stefano used, such as Nibobel, and the rest is NumPy. And what we will do is something that Stefano should tell us, but let's check what looks really uh, different for us. We want to make it a little bit clear from the sense of coding practices. So, what we will do is to help the metric file and write some explanation here about using the correct met metric for atlases. And that's, that's the task we, we are going to do. Uh, 
I'll be try, trying to copy the necessary code from there. So sorry, it's just taking some time. One thing we want to add is, as an explanation, is to explain the metric. So it's this one. So we want to make sure that target returns the defined rank equivalence. That's it. The other thing is the play with the function. It was already defined. Hey. Wrong copy. So this will be the thing, and we are adding the mask. Stefan, I'm hoping you are arrived. Still in waiting room. I think you should be here now. <laughs> because I need his comments while I was, I'm butchering your uh, code. So I'm, I broke new chills. So let's fix. <laughs> <laughs> while you were away, I was showing how to break things down. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Can you hear me fine? Yes. Yeah. Very sorry for this little interruption. It's just that uh, I have to move in order to be able to continue. Um, all right. So what happened to this repository? Actually, I added the comment mm -hmm. and I, I'm just editing the, uh, the code part that we are uh, planning to use. Okay. That's great. Um, all right, so the reason for which we choose to, to show you this repository is just, just uh, to show you how good we are in coding Python, uh, yeah. but also man, mainly because uh, we want to show you a real interaction that happens on GitHub and the real reason for which you actually can put things on GitHub and should share your code. Um, don't be afraid of sending things on GitHub. Don't be afraid to take whatever you're doing and putting it up there. It's not going to be just a favor to the community because if they need to do exactly what you were doing and you already did and they already implemented, then they're just going to be able to literally copy it instead of spending a lot of time doing it again from scratch. Um, I tried to do from scratch while you're away, but I did a <laughs> funny mistake, so let's ignore it. All right. Um, but the other... The other thing that you can do is actually have people check your code and actually help you implement something better. And uh, that's what's happening here, I guess. Yes. Um, right? Yes. All right. In this case, we're just adding some, some lines, adding some things. Um, I'm hoping it's, it's okay. All right. The thing that we can do now is basically try to... Uh, send these modifications back to upstream. And the way we're going to do this, uh, Selim, if you can share. Yes, I'll, I'll be sharing in a minute, minute-ish. OK. Mm -hmm. Now we are at the terminal. That's great. So the first thing that we're going to do 
uh, and the city that didn't do yet, is actually creating a branch. As I told you before, um, we, when we use Git, we can actually create different parallel uh, development lines, let's say, development steps. Uh, and that helps us because not only like we want to maintain main as our uh, most intact and, and most functional uh, representation of the repository and, and the code and the files, but also because uh, we can do many different things at the same time on the code. And that's what we're going to do here, for example. So the first thing that we're going to do is create a branch and we can do that by saying git checkout and then we're gonna add a little minus B that stands for branch. This is much more intuitive than before. And then uh, a name for this branch. And in this case, it could be Sally, up to you. What name do you want okay. to add? Mm, actually, it should be referring to the what we did. So we did some, uh, let me remember. just composition or something like this. I don't know, I, I want to keep things concrete, but I don't know. I just want, I have tendency to write my name, but if you have some convention, I'm fine with it. I think we can, we can skip conventions. We can just say uh, first no, contribution. Okay. <laughs> It's right. Just avoid spaces in the name of a branch because yes. it will not like it. So that should be right. That's fantastic. In this way, we gave a command that helped us not only create a new branch for our Git, but also to move straight away to that new branch. Uh, that's an important thing because when you want to track changes in different branches, you have to manually change them, switch between them, right? If you wanted to switch between two different branches, you could do it with this checkout. So for instance, let's go back to main, to master, sorry, in this case, uh, we could do git checkout, master. And right, and now we see we switch the branch master and uh, we see that our branch is up, by the way, up to date with origin and, and master, and that's great. Uh, and now we can switch back to to first contribution and we would do it in the same way and actually you could have auto completion already uh, if you want to and that's great and now we are back into the man to the branch first contribution which means that every time that we're going to add and commit files we're going to commit them to this new branch um, the thing that could happen sometimes is that you're lost. You don't know which branch you're on at that time. And in order to check it is, is actually quite simple. You can just say git status and you should see the first line says on branch, in this case, first contribution. So yes, we are exactly where we would be and we want to be, uh, which is great. So now that we have those changes, we did some, some little things. We want to add them and commit them. I can just fast track, I feel mm -hmm. like, because I just added it one yeah. file. Yeah. So this is you my- You to say commit. But Yo, oh, rest. okay. Yes. Oh. <laughs> That's why I'm the student. <laughs> okay, my commit message is I wrote Python. Yay. And once we something mm -hmm. silly, probably. I mm. so when this happens, it's basically because Git is reading that uh, your message is not complete mm -hmm. yet, which is strange because actually you completed. So the thing that the best thing that we can do is actually just uh, give it a control C, just drop the command as it is. And we're gonna try to write it again. Maybe let's let's avoid that. Uh, yeah, maybe just let's let's just avoid that. Uh, all right. It was something clear. boring. Yeah, quite straightforward. It's all right for this for this presentation. Um, the next thing that we're gonna do is, as we told you before, pushing these changes to your 
origin. All right, and I'm sorry I cannot follow the chat anymore. Uh, but yeah, in this case, so in this case, what happened is that we again, we once again pushed uh, everything to master. What we want to do is instead push our changes to the uh, branch first contribution to another branch in origin that would be called first contribution as well. So we can do git push minus u origin and then if you can delete master and then just put first contribution. That will help us finding different things. And we can see that we have something happened in the background, which means that something we did something right. And that something is that we just pushed to GitHub our changes. Now, uh, once we did that, it's probably because like once we've worked on everything and we want our other people to, to see what we did, that's the best moment to open something that is called the pull request, the process that I was telling you before. And as I was telling you before, it's this is a conversation that is going to start and it's going to uh, take place between two different contributors to, um, to a repository. What we can do to open this pull request uh, is actually very simple. If it's like, if you if you commit something and then you push it and it's the first time that you're pushing something and, and it's quite recent, there's gonna be a huge banner in your GitHub page saying, hey, it's something changed. You can do a pull request now. Do you want to do it? Uh, and you can say, yeah, sure, let's do it. And it will open this page. If by any mean, and maybe you, you do something and then a month later, you remember that you had to pull shit uh, somewhere, uh, you can still do a pull request. Um, and that would be just by going into, you can see uh, in the line above everything, there is code, there's issues and there's pull request. And if you go there, there will be a little, uh, a little box saying, uh, create a new pull request. And actually we were, I was on your repo and I was added, it automatically sent me to the pull request because- Yeah, 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 because it, like you push something automatically. Yeah. That's totally fine. Uh, but if you want to do it after a while, you can just go on pull request. And then you see that there is a, a green box saying new pull request. Um, it's actually there. And if you click on it, you can just compare, first of all, the changes between two different branches in this case. But actually what we want to do is create a comparison between forks between different repository, remote repositories online. So we will say compare across forks. Once we see that, we want the base repository to be our upstream. So in this case, it's legendary Octo Invention uh, from Asmoya. The base branch, it will be base master because you want to send everything there. And the head repository is where you did your modifications. So in this case, I am dev. And then the compare will be coming from the branch uh, first contribution. And this page will give us like basically the same thing that we will see if you use git diff. You can use git diff even in uh, between different branches. The command is, is, is the same, it's git diff. Um, but in this case, we have it online and honestly, it's quite easier to see it online already. Um, so, but it's the same thing. Like we will see exactly the same thing if we used it in the terminal. Um, this let us see what we did and see if you're ready to create the pull request. And if you are ready to create the pull request, the thing that we can do is just saying, yeah, create the pull request for view. And then we'll add a title for this pull request. Uh, we can add some content to the first message that will comment what this pull request is about. Uh, for instance, there uh, you can say, oh, it doesn't matter, really. Uh, you can just say, I did some changes. Obviously, the more specific you are, for instance, saying, uh, I implemented this new thing and the way I did it was yada, 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 uh, will help 
other people to see and look and, and judge what you did. Uh, I'm using the word judge, it's, it's not that bad actually, but just check and, and, and get an idea of what they should be expecting while they read your code and your changes. So try always to be more specific, but in this case, let's just keep it and, and move to the next step, which is basically creating the first pull request. And the thing you have done in your repo, maybe we can just quickly mention that uh, there's a template here. Yeah, yeah. And actually the next thing that we're gonna see is how to add that template. Uh, but for the moment, let's open the pull request. Uh, yeah, so a template basically means this. When you, if you open this pull request, or anything else um, in the repository, you might just see an empty box of text where you have to add things inside. Uh, you can use templates that are literally just uh, little files that will tell GitHub, please use this like pre-configured message so that people can change it and do things a bit more like you would like to. Uh, using templates help contributors to uh, get an idea of what the what you would expect from them. So basically, like I expect you to tell me what the proposed changes are in this case, or I'm expecting you to tell me what are the differences, or maybe sometimes people can ask you, uh, do you think this is a, uh, like which kind of, of changes do you think this is? Is this a, a change to some test files? Is this a change to uh, a chapter of a particular book? Is this a change to the documentation and et cetera, et cetera. Um, for the moment, we have, our, we have our pull request, it's open. And I'm gonna share my screen now because I'm gonna show you what happens. I'm gonna show you what happens when uh, you're working on the other side and you might be receiving the pull requests from somebody else. And in this case, I did receive a pull request. Can you see the, can you see the screen fine? I don't wanna... uh, we see your web browser. Yeah, I'm just gonna reopen the, the sharing because yeah, you should yeah. be seeing all the web browser now, right? Yeah. That's great. So you see that I went just here and pull requests uh, and I saw this pull request from uh, Selim and I said, all right, cool. Oh, there's some changes. And well, she's telling me, oh, he's telling me, like you really pardon. Uh, he's telling me that there's some changes on Anatas function, which is super unique and specific. Uh, and now we go to the changes and they can see what he did. Uh, and I can see that most of them look fine, but for example, here, there's some repetition of code. When you're looking into uh, a pull request, you, uh, and you, you are receiving this pull request, so you're the person that is requested to take the code, you always need to think, what is the scope of this code? How this code would uh, fit inside the, the library that is already existing? Uh, and whether there is repetitions or whether these these, these changes is actually uh, it's, it's it's perfect it's it's in line and and it's uh, point to uh, what you're doing. This might not be easy when you just see a part of the file. So a suggestion that I have, if you ever end up being a reviewer of some pull request, is always at least open up and expand uh, to see the full file, but even better, just bring it to your computer, to your local uh, machine and then check it there. Um, and if you have something to say to the, to the developer, which like always in a respectful way, because you always need to remember that uh, they gave you some time, some uh, features, and obviously they're, they're doing something for you at the same time as for them, but also for you. So always in a respectful way, you can say, for instance, hey, uh, this is a copy. For instance, this, this, this leaped out. Uh, uh, but it's not necessary. And you can start a review which is basically saying, I'm checking your code and I want to give you these messages. And sometimes you can even just, if it's something quick, you can even just say, okay, I'm gonna suggest you straight away what you should do with your code rather than 
writing an elaborate description of just change or fine. Um, and for instance, in this case, I'm telling uh, Selim, please remove these. And you can go on and check things. And once you're done, uh, you can start this, like keep on with this conversation. And this conversation basically will start with a, I request you to do some changes, but uh, it starts great. Check the review. And then you submit this review and we're back to uh, selling. And Selim, if you want to share your screen. Now Selim can see that going to the same PR, there's some changes. Uh, and I'm suggesting some changes and I'm also commenting some more. And Selim yeah, it can say, yeah, I, it, it's fine. Uh, I accept your, your changes. And if you just want to accept a change that was suggested, you can do that commit suggestion there and that will just do it for you. Uh, just like... <laughs> Sounds great. And in the meantime, you can tell me that you're doing something else. And once you did everything that you wanted to do, you can continue this conversation. Uh, that is the pull request. And for instance, you can just say, hey, I did everything that you wanted me to do. Uh, care to have a look again and tell me if it's okay or not. by, for instance, leaving a message. Um, and once that's done, uh, I can go back. Normally, this will, will involve uh, changing some things, uh, the full process that we saw before, which is basically changing, saving the files, adding the files, committing the files, pushing them to the same branch from which you open the pull request. Once you do it, normally the branch is automatically updated and your pull request is automatically updated with it. And uh, you can just push it back to the, 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 the reviewers. Uh, normally it's, it's, it's just a good thing to write, hey, I'm done with the checks, uh, please check it again. So they receive a, an inbox email and can say, okay, cool. Uh, I'm gonna check it again. And for the sake of time, uh, I'm just gonna share my screen. Yes. Sorry. And uh, just say, oh yeah, there's some more changes and you can go back and see the changes. And I know already what they are, but it's good to know that there is some conversation that were resolved, which means that a part of it was already done. Some other conversation that can be resolved by you. And once you're done, the best moment for both a reviewer and a contributor, it's the moment of approval in which you say, hey, it looks great. It actually looks good to me. You will see a lot of GTM. Uh, it's just then for looks good to me. Uh, some people believe that it's like, uh, it looks legitimate, which is another good interpretation, uh, but to just say yes, and once you do it, you can merge this pull request. And everything that Selim did up until now will end up being in, uh, in a new code, in a new representation of a master in my upstream, um, which is great. Now, there's one last thing that we want to show you before the last couple of questions and then uh, the next panel, and it's this. Selim, can you share again your screen and go into uh, and check this repository from your site, please? It's successfully merged and closed. Yeah. So we can see now that like the pull requests were merged, like we close it because obviously it's, it's solved. Oh, thank you. <laughs> 
giving a little reaction. That's great. Um, the next thing that, that I want to show you, though, is that uh, the contribution coming from other people are not the only type of contribution that you can get in GitHub. Sometimes you can sell, tell other people what you would like to be done. And actually, the best thing ever is that uh, before you were saying, how can people that don't use Git or GitHub or doesn't want to learn Python or stuff like that still help the rest of the community, right? That was the end of, uh, of the talk with Danny and, and Cassandra. And one great way in which if you don't know Git and you don't know Python or you don't know coding and you still want to contribute without having to learn all of this stuff is actually test out code, test out uh, read papers, read documents that are online, and then say, hey, I used it, I read it, I interacted with it, and I have some suggestions. And how do you need those suggestions? You open issues. Uh, in GitHub, there's like, there's this uh, little tab that is like next to code, it's issues. Sometimes you find issues already uh, open. That would be the developer telling you there is something that you can work on sometimes you can leave them a message saying, hey, I worked on it and I have this suggestion for you. And then the developers will start talking about it and, and, and work on it. But in this moment, we are uh, showing a, uh, an issue that, yeah, that uh, I opened before. And because maybe you know, you're, you're working on this repository, but you don't have time to finish everything. And, uh, oh yeah, you find this code out read. I know, uh, it needs more comments and documentation, uh, which at a certain point somebody will do, possibly the next contributor. Uh, but for the moment, it's a great issue that, that you can send to the developer saying, please do this. And that would help so much the next person that works with it. Uh, so thank you very much, Selim, for these, opening this issue. Uh, and again, even if you're not a Git expert, even if you're not a Python expert or a coder or whatever, just opening these issues help a lot because you're telling people how they would be able to improve their software. And not only, it also helps you and the rest of the community because you basically make the gap between the people that write code and the people that use it much smaller in this way. Now, we have two issues here. One of them has something next to it, and that something next to it is called a label. A label is basically a way that GitHub uses to tell you more or less uh, the type of uh, issues or even PRs that you have in front of you. The best label that you can look for in a GitHub repository, especially if you're at the beginning and you want to start working with a person, start uh, working on a project, uh, or maybe you just want to start moving your first step in Git, GitHub and coding in general, or whatever you will be working on, is this label called Good First Issue. Good First Issues are normally uh, issues that are opened by developers in which they indicate a change that is sometimes trivial. Sometimes it's literally just about changing a name of a function or removing a couple of, of, uh, of commas. They are incredibly easy and incredibly simple. And normally they're even uh, much better documented in the steps that should be done in order to carry them out than what I put here uh, as an example. But basically you will find these issues around and you can use them to learn and to help other people and start learning about the repository and et cetera, et cetera. In this case, I'm suggesting that uh, as we talked about before, uh, it might be good for people, like for people to have some templates when they open issues, not only when they open PRs. And uh, that's what I, uh, that's that's what I said here. Hey, uh, would you like to do this uh, for me? Because you know I don't have time to do this in this moment, uh, or whatever. I'm working on something else, or uh, this is something very easy that you could use in order to start building a community around your software or your documents or your article or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if you have time, we can try to, to do this PR. Yes. If we don't, because I see that it's quite, uh, what do you reckon? Uh, 
Or six yeah. minutes until the end. And I mean, we can give or take if, like five minutes. OK. Um, all right. So good. So you saw before there's like the issues was, was empty when, when uh, Selim started writing it. And that's normally what happens. That's, that's a normality. Um, now, Selim is going to try to address this, uh, this issue and basically add some templates to my repository. And the way that you can do this is actually like, I think that there's already a branch in this code, like we prepared before that contains all the issue templates. Uh, if you go on code, so you will see this is actually a super fake interaction uh, that was obviously prepared before. Uh, but if you go in the G1F, because I'm a little bit dyslexic, dyslexic and I wrote good first first instead of good first issue, uh, you see that already this will contain uh, the templates that I was talking about. And this specifically, they will be in the folder called .github and issue template. And that's a lot of things mm -hmm. that you can contribute. And now, normally what would happen is that uh, Selim could actually write this document. Like normally what would happen is that Selim writes these documents in, its own, in his own uh, computer and then do the full process that we saw up until now many times, which is basically change, save, add, commit, push to a new yeah. branch in origin, in his origin, and then create a PR to uh, upstream to this, uh, to this thing. For the sake of time, we're going to skip all of that. We're just going to open a quick pull request. And I beg your pardon for that. But at this point, it starts to be a bit late. So if you're going up, yeah, instead of, of using the terminal, we're just going to do a pull request straight away from GitHub. Because of course, you can also do pull requests between different branches and not just between different forks. So we're going to set the base repository and the head repository as, as Moya. That's fine. Uh, and then we're going to say the base is master and the compare is G1F. So the branch that contains the changes. And there should be something to compare. case there's nothing uh, because actually Git is recording that um, some files were removed and that happened in a different moment. Um, so I'm very sorry about that. I think we will just keep this little representation of a new PR. Uh, that's going to be fine anyway. But we know that uh, that we can do that as well. And with that, I think that we're going to finish more or less. Yes. Just give me one second. That's all from our tutorial. We have all the materials ready uh, from here. Actually, I can share the link to the materials. So once again, uh, you can find the materials here if you want to check them out. And just very quickly, I'm going to do up this. That is basically skipping everything because I changed computer in the meantime, if you didn't realize it yet. Uh, and just say, if you want to start contributing to some Git and have some Git fun, uh, you can go and check the hack tracks of different events. For instance, in this case, I used the Brain Hack Global event that happened in 2020, but all of these things are still open and they are repositories that you can check out and probably contains some modification that you might want to have a look at. And uh, for instance, there's this beautiful project that is called Ecovidas that will help you writing better methods and you can have a look at it and it's normally very well done um, because it's Remigo. And otherwise you can see other things that you can uh, uh, you might have want to look at. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. Oh, we are there as well. Like there's Spizify there. So check us out if you want. Um, and other things. And just go there, try to have fun, try to contact people, try to.
you are somehow muted. Yeah, Stefano, we cannot hear you anymore. Is he still there? I cannot see. Yes, he is. He's trying to talk, but we don't hear anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I can't read lips. <laughs> Sorry. After second try, we lost the track. I think to tie in with what Stefano was saying, um, if people want to learn to know more, there are obviously also the hackathon projects in this event. Yeah. So I'm sure uh, you can just join one of those projects and start contributing in that way to learn also a bit more about Git, because I think all of them will be doing that. So that, that's some, I, I guess, some good hands-on practice to start using these things. <laughs> Now we can hear you, Sahel. <laughs> oh, now we can. Yeah, now we can. All right, sorry. Oh, you're sorry. muted now. You're <laughs> muted. Uh, so thank you very much, Stefan. Yes, that's exactly what I wanted to say. You can check out there is a hack track also in uh, the OpenMR 2021 virtual. Uh, check it out. Uh, there's still more or less the same people playing out, uh, being nerds. And you can join them. And that's a great way to learn Git and coding and other things. And for a moment, that's all. I just want to thank a couple of people, which is basically my group here in San Sebastian, another group that I'm working with, and, and got Git enthusiasts uh, in, um, in Chicago that we are working quite often together. Uh, we would like to thank uh, both the Insane Mauer institutions and our friends around. But especially a, good, a big thanks to uh, this group of people that you can see here down. They are the PhysioPy contributors. And honestly, when we started PhysioPy one year and a half ago, uh, I didn't know how to use Git at all. Uh, I don't know if you, if you noticed it today. Uh, and I learned it. And the way I learned it was basically just collaborating with them because they are amazing people, fantastic uh, contributors, fantastic uh, coders, fantastic documenters, fantastic. Uh, there's this guy here, you might know him. He's called Daniel Alcala. Um, he made our basically uh, all the graphics for our website. So that's another way you can contribute to, uh, to uh, online repositories. Um, and it's just thanks to them that I learned how to do all these things. And now I can share them with you. And again, this is just to say, jump in, just go and play with some people being a nerd using Git. And thank you again for your attention. If you're not sleeping yet, uh, I'm very, very sorry for the change of computer, for the noise that came out for the whole time. Um, and don't forget that if there's a fire, save your files first and then save yourself. And yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Stefano. And thank, thanks from my side as well. I uh, wholeheartedly thank all the organizers and Stefano for his patience. Hey, everyone. Yeah, thank you as well, uh, Rolf and Celine. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm wondering if there are any questions. Uh, we didn't receive that many questions from the chat. So maybe um, there are any questions now? There are also no questions in the docs. So okay. we can start from, uh, from scratch. Well, I have a, a question actually, um, but it might be longer to answer or we can get engaged into some kind of discussion that is not too Git related. Well, it's Git related, but it's uh, not purely Git related. Um, so I don't know if there are first other questions that we can address. Okay, I, I think not. <laughs> Okay, yeah, then perhaps I will uh, just uh, just start with the question. So, um, first of all, thank you so much. This is uh, every time I think Sophie just mentioned it, um, that uh, every time you, you get into a Git workshop, you learn something new and there is some command that you haven't seen yet. And this is what I love about Git tutorials. <laughs> Um, and the way you the, the way you guys did it with the two of you, really kudos. It was very, very nice. Made it interactive. That's the first thing that I want to say. Um, the second thing is that we are we were collaborating. That was actually my first collaborative project uh, with Git uh, for the data visualization that we have tomorrow. Um, and this Jupyter Notebook, um, well, I, I love working with, with, with Git, but with Jupyter Notebook, really, it 
really makes sense to me still uh, because you have all these output this metadata that is being saved and if you look at a git diff you're just yeah getting lost in metadata. I was wondering oh, how you guys tackle this and how it is because Jupyter notebooks are really the way to go for example for these tutorials but if you want to use it in git you're actually getting a little bit shot into the in the in the lag I don't know how you feel about that Short answer, I, I feel angry about it. <laughs> <laughs> because I always use Jupyter Notebooks for my deep learning site and I can never use Git for those, but Colab is nice. And Stefano, I think you have more concrete answer. Actually, no, I was saying, I was about to say, do you have a better answer? Because mine is just don't use Git Notebooks. Uh, sorry, yeah, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, no. The thing is this, uh, it's true that for some files, uh, Git will not work as well as other things. Um, for instance, I was saying before, you might end up uh, working on an article, a paper uh, that you're modifying in uh, Word 1997, 1995, like earlier versions that didn't use the, the docx extension yet or you might be using libreoffice that doesn't use automatically the uh, xdml version of the files yet um, and that basically means that you're creating binary files and that that's files that are not text files that git can interpret which is a pity uh, so what happens there is that normally either there's a an existing service that helps you interpreting those files i hope you can hear me over the noises by the way uh, there's there's either software uh, similar to Git or maybe other version control system or maybe uh, some expansions of, of Git that helps you dealing with those files. Um, or just don't use them. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> or um, you can still use Git. The only thing is that obviously you will not be able to do this. Uh, it's still useful to use Git in these cases because at the very least you are forced to track changes and then uh, make commits, make messages and say what you changed and that will still help you. Um, but obviously, yeah, you will not be able to use the diff uh, to see the differences between two steps. No, indeed. It's a pity. But it's, it's, but it's not, not too much of a big deal in that sense that no, well, um, uh, if if you're working on, for example, in this case, if you're really working towards a tutorial, then yes. On the other hand, it's it's often that you already have a lot of code and you just want to like uh, have a clean way of presenting it. And then you might indeed end up with just uh, copy pasting some blocks yeah. and adding some markdown in between just to make it like logical to follow. But I, uh, yeah, I really agree on that. It's, uh, just it's, uh, just a way of thinking perhaps that so many people like Jupyter Notebooks and there is this, and so many people I like get, and then I'm like, this should somehow yeah. be fixed. But uh, yeah. um, I'm not aware if there's a solution already for JupyterX uh, is the solution actually. Yeah. I heard it okay. from that uh, guys. They're using JupyterX, and it's the mainstream solution. You can use Binder and the uh, Binder version. It tracks the changes, and you can it still shows the binary file, but it can, the JupyterX allows you to just track the mm, changes. Yeah, that, that's like that. But you can still see the, that big bin, binary file, but mm -hmm. the changes. Okay, great. And how is that called? Sorry. I just put the link to the chat. JupyterX, it's, it's the package. Jupyter. And how to use it is the detailed answer is there. And FastAI is using it all the time. Okay, thanks. Thanks for this uh, suggestion. Cool. Okay, I think um, it's time to uh, round up because uh, we're already in break time. Uh, and we also have an interesting panel discussion in 20 minutes. Um, so I encourage you to attend it as well. Um, <laughs> but uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Melvin Selim and uh, Stefano, for your really great uh, interactive workshop. And um, I really hope that all, all the people attending also found it useful. I, I already knew a bit of Git, but I also learned some new things, so that's good. Um, so with that, I think uh, we should, we should uh, go into the break. Um, just like uh, before, everyone is welcome to also join in a gather room or to play a game in the meantime. 
and uh, we will come back at well in 20 minutes so 3 30 in our on our time zone um to go into a great interactive panel discussion so um, i hope to see you all there and uh, have a great break <laughs>